Welcome to a beginner's guide to Roxy Music. If you like this video, please don't forget to tap the like button and subscribe. And don't forget the notification bell if you want to keep up with future videos. Thank you. Most North Americans remember one or maybe two things about the band Roxy Music, either their 1970s top 40 hit Love is the Drug, or perhaps their early 1980s hit more than this. But as that second title suggests, there's more than this to the band. A lot more. They enjoyed much more success in the UK and Australia than they did in America. They produced a total of eight studio albums with a lot of memorable content that got missed outside of the aforementioned UK, Australia and occasionally Europe. Here's a look. Roxy Music were an English rock band formed in 1970 by Brian Ferry, the band's lead singer and main songwriter, bass guitarist Graham Simpson and other longtime members guitarist Phil Manzanera, Andy Mackay, on saxophone and oboe, and Paul Thompson, drums and percussion. Other members have included Brian Eno, synthesizer, Eddie Jobson, synthesizer and violin, and John Gustafson bass. The band became a successful act in Europe and Australia during the 1970s, while achieving only modest success in North America. Their European successes began with their self-titled debut album in 1972. The band was unique. While establishing itself as a glam rock outfit alongside similar styled acts such as David Bowie and T-Rex, with the addition of Eno's treatments and experimentation, Roxy Music crafted some very unusual and unique music that set them apart from other acts. They were a significant influence on some of the early English punk bands and most certainly created a lane for many new wave acts that followed in the 1980s, such as Duran Duran, Ultra Vox and even early Simple Minds. The band's two preeminent creative forces, Ferry and Eno have also had influential solo careers. Ferry becoming an arguably even bigger success in his own right, while Eno became one of the biggest music producers of the modern era. The band was marked by two distinct eras. The glam rock period of 1972 to 1976 and the stylish art rock of 1979 through 1982. The two eras had distinctly different sounds, although they are indeed connected by some common threads. The glam rock period. In June of 1972, Roxy Music released their self-titled debut album. The album had no singles released. Instead, as a promotional gambit, a song that was not even on the album, though it was added in later re-releases, was released in August of that year. The song, Virginia Plain, reached number 4 on the British charts. The band's eccentric visual image in their debut performance on the BBC's Top of the Pops, became a cornerstone for the glam trend in the United Kingdom. The single and Top of the Pops appearance, caused a renewed interest in the album, which ended up charting as high as number 10 on the UK album chart. The album featured two songs of note, Remake Slash Remodel and Lady Tron. The former featured a cacophony of sounds, anguished vocals all with a catchy chorus, and an odd alphanumeric chant. The chant it turns out was the license plate of a car carrying a beautiful woman. This was a perfect fit for a song about a man attracted to a woman but afraid to approach her. Lady Tron was about a Casanova-esque seduction, but what was most notable, was that the song was dominated by the sounds of Eno-driven experimentation that underlay many of the band's early efforts. Just nine months after their debut album, in March 1973, Roxy Music released their second album, For Your Pleasure. Once again the album featured no singles, despite some distinctive content. Instead, the band promoted the album with the release of the single Pajama Rock. The song had been excluded from the album, but was released as a single prior to the album. The song peaked at number 10 in Britain. The album meanwhile, reached as high as number 4. The quirky approach to non-album songs as singles, whether deliberate or unintended, whether band-driven or management-driven, didn't seem to hurt album sales. In fact, arguably, it helped. Meanwhile the album exhibited growth in terms of song composition from Ferry, and production treatment from Eno. This was thanks in part to being afforded more studio time than for their debut album. In Every Dream Home A Heartache, Ferry's unusual ode to a blow-up doll, Eno's treatments are on full display. Quirky does not begin to describe the song lyrically or sonically. On the first cut on the album, Do The Strand, Ferry's writing delves further into driving anthemic beat reminiscent of Virginia Plain and Remake Remodel. Interestingly, the song was not a single in Roxy Music's native UK but was released as a single elsewhere. And later, for their greatest hits album, it was released as a single in 1978. Soon after the tour to promote the For Your Pleasure album ended, Brian Eno left Roxy Music as increasing artistic differences he was having with Ferry came to a head. 
This would result in the artistic image and sound beginning to move to the forefront and the experimental sounds fading from the Roxy music soundscape. Following the departure of Eno, and just eight months after the sophomore album, Roxy Music released their third album, entitled Stranded. It was the first album on which Brian Ferry was not the only writer, Phil Manzanera and Andy Mackay also contributed. The album reached number one on the UK album chart. This also was the first time the band released a single using a song that was actually on the album. That song was Street Life which reached number nine on the UK singles chart. It also followed in the mold of Virginia Plain Music. But the album featured some other notable songs. Amazona, co-written by Ferry and Manzanera, provided some funky guitar and even some Eno-style production treatments. Along with the next album Country Life, Rolling Stone magazine regarded Stranded as marking the zenith of contemporary British art rock. The songs on these two albums, and the accompanying live performances, were succeeding in cementing Ferry's adapted persona as the epitome of the suave yet jaded Euro dilettante. If that wasn't an actual thing, Ferry seemed to be making it one. At a minimum, he was fostering that sensibility into mass cultural consciousness. November 1974 saw the release of Country Life, Roxy Music's fourth album. It was the first of their albums to make the top 40 album charts in the US, although only peaking at number 37. In the UK the album peaked at number 3, just shy of its chart-topping predecessor. It would be the most well-rounded Roxy Music album to date. Two singles were released in October, the guitar-driven, hard-edged The Thrill of It All, which did not chart but was a worthy follow-up to previous raucous Roxy Music offerings, indicative of glam rock at its peak. The follow-up single, All I Want Is You However, a similar style tune, did manage to peak at number 12 on the UK singles chart. The next album, Siren, released in October 1975, is the one that really put Roxy Music on the map in North America. The album release was preceded by the release of the single Love is the Drug in September of that year. It was Roxy Music's highest charting song to that point, peaking at number 2 in the UK and later at number 30 in the USA in early 1976. The song also peaked at number 3 in Canada and number 8 in the Netherlands. In addition, it made the top 20 in Australia and in New Zealand. On the strength of that single and its follow-up, Siren peaked at number 4 on the British album charts, marking the fifth straight album to be certified gold by BPI, the British phonographic industry, keeping the Roxy Music Gold album streak alive. The follow-up single, Both Ends Burning did not fare as well but still managed to reach number 25 on the UK singles chart. It did not chart in the US or Canada, where it was not necessarily intended to do so. It served instead as the B-side of the Love is the Drug single. The band toured in 1976 in support of Siren, and afterwards disbanded. In July of 1976 a live album Viva was released. Viva did not certify as a gold record in the UK. Only silver. This marked the first non-gold album for the band. Since it was a live album however, their studio album Gold Record Streak remained intact, unlike the band unfortunately. In the following two years, the lead creative force of the band, Brian Ferry, released two solo records. They were not his first, during his time with Roxy Music he had already released two solo albums. Though technically disbanded, Manzanera and Thompson both joined to perform on Ferry solo albums. Manzanera also reunited with Brian Eno on the critically acclaimed one-off 801 live album. During the band's interim period, in 1977 a Greatest Hits album was also released. It put Roxy Music back on track with their gold record standard. And by 1978 Roxy Music had already reunited to work on a new album, Manifesto, but with a slightly different lineup. Art Rock The new lineup and new album marked the beginning of the art rock period for the band. The music was taking on a new dimension. With their glam rock period behind them, the reformed band had reformed their sound. Now in the band, were Paul Carrick on keyboards, replacing Eddie Jobson. While Alan Spenner and Gary Tibbs split the responsibilities on bass. In March of 1979 the band released their sixth studio album, Manifesto. The album ended up peaking at number four in the UK charts and was once again certified gold, marking their sixth straight gold album in the UK. It also marked their greatest success in America, reaching number 23 on the Billboard album charts. The first single, Trash, only managed to reach number 40 on the UK singles chart, but it marked a clear change in direction for the band, with a remarkably popish new wave sound. 
The second single, Dance Away, was released in April of that year and fared far better. The song peaked at number two in the UK and made it as high as number 44 on the Billboard charts in America. Continuing Roxy Music's earlier trend of weird marketing, while the song was indeed on the album this time, the single was a remixed version of the song, quite different from what was found on the album. It didn't seem to matter. The song was a hit, their highest charting one so far, peaking as high as Love as the Drug did. And it created momentum for the band. By August of that year the next single Angel Eyes was released. Not only was it different than the album version, it was entirely re-recorded, marking a second straight single that was entirely different from the album version of the song. However, it fared almost as well as its predecessor, reaching number 4 on the UK singles chart. Unlike the singles, the album did not reach as high on the British album charts as did any of its studio album predecessors, except for their self-titled debut. It reached a respectable number 7 on the charts. However, with the three singles released, Manifesto was another Roxy Music album to be certified gold by the BPI. It was their sixth straight gold album out of six studio albums released. Seven of seven if you include the Greatest Hits album. Critically, the album received a lukewarm reception. One critic stating the obvious takeaway, while this was not Roxy Music at their most innovative, it was certainly Roxy Music at their most listenable. But still, there was a momentum building. The 1980s was a new decade, and it started for Roxy Music with the release in May of 1980, of their seventh studio album Flesh and Blood. The trend towards a smoother sound continued unabated, as did the trend towards chart hits for the band. The sound had become unmistakable. The released singles, as well as a couple of cover songs that could have also been strong singles, carried a smoothness that seemed miles away from their glam rock days. Critics did not exactly gush over the album, finding its silky smoothness unfit for the times. Disco was in full retreat at the time, and many critics were mistakenly viewing Roxy Music through that lens. As is often the case, the critics didn't matter. The album became the band's first to be certified platinum. The first single, Over You, was released the same month as the album, and provided another top 10 UK hit for the band. It rose as high as number 5 on the singles chart. In the US, the single did not match its UK success, peaking only at number 80. This was the typical pattern for the band, underperforming in America relative to their home country. With its synth-pop sound, Over You was arguably right at the forefront of the British New Wave movement. Although for some, Love is the Drug was closer to the real starting point of New Wave. The album also featured the single Oh Yeah, released in July of 1980. Like its predecessor it reached number 5 in the UK. It featured a similar synth-heavy sound but with a slower, more melancholy mood. The song, Miles Away from Glam Rock, was foreshadowing the sounds that would follow on Roxy Music's next, most iconic album. A third single from Flesh and Blood was released in November of 1980. The song Same Old Scene performed serviceably, charting as high as number 12. It continued to delve into synth-fueled angst, intertwining art rock and what could be called new wave sounds. The album had briefly peaked in the UK album charts at number 1, in June of 1980. Impressively, it returned to top spot for three more weeks in August, showing staying power and the commercial strength the album possessed. Hoping to capitalize on the success of the album, in December, the label released the album's cover version of Wilson Pickett's In the Midnight Hour in the US. The song didn't quite reach the top 100 singles, but it did manage to get some airplay. In the Midnight Hour definitely did not possess the new wave vibe of the other singles. It certainly did put a suave, debonair, cufflinked, art rock stamp on the band, and in particular, Fairy's reputation. Such was the swagger of the song, it was actually the first track on the album. In the wake of John Lennon's death in late 1980, Roxy Music started including his song Jealous Guy, as a tribute to the music pioneer, during their live performances. They recorded a version, and released it as a single in February of 1981. The song was a huge hit in Europe, particularly in the UK, where it would become the first, and only, Roxy Music song to reach number one. It lasted in the top spot for two weeks. It also made it to the top spot in Australia. Once again, the song did not chart in America, although it did crack the top 100 in the US years later, in 1988, reaching number 80. In May of 1982, the band released its eighth and final album, Avalon. The album marked the epitome of the art rock sound, not just for the band, but for all of music. Avalon was somber, but fashioned with beautifully crafted melodies and sound textures. Its melotones are such a radical departure from their earlier glam rock efforts, that some of the earlier era, hardcore fans, 
would not recognize the sound of the Mark 1982 version of Roxy Music. Other than perhaps the distinctive vocals of Ferry. Nevertheless, Avalon was a huge commercial success, appealing to an entirely new audience. It reached number one in the UK, being certified platinum in the process. And while it got nowhere near that point in the US, its appeal was durable. It remained in the charts for quite a long time, and was later certified platinum in America as well, marking their greatest success there. The album spawned several memorable songs of the band at its art rock peak. The first single, More Than This, released in April 1982, fit in perfectly with the new wave era the band helped foster. It featured a lengthy, synthesizer-dominated outro, without any vocals from Ferry, an unusual notion for a pop song, but it worked. The song peaked at number 6 in the UK, marking their last top 10 hit there. While the song only reached number 58 on the Billboard Top Rock tracks, it outstripped Love as the drug to become the band's signature song in America. More than this was followed in June with the release of the album's title track Avalon. The evocative sounds with stunning backing vocals by Yannick Etienne, is a romantic, melodic and slow-moving dance that is the epitome of smooth. While the song reached the top 10 in many countries, it peaked at number 13 in the band's native UK, and only at number 59 on Billboard's mainstream rock chart in America. But in many ways it defined the latter-day sound of Roxy music for the new wave generation. The album's third single, Take a Chance With Me, reached number 26. But likely due in large part to the B-side of the single, which was the main thing. The latter featured an entrancing yet driving rhythmic beat that fit the early 80s seamlessly. The Avalon album as a whole was lush, mellow and well-crafted. While it may not be typical of the early version of Roxy Music, it's arguably an essential album to have. Beyond its dreamlike nature, there are strong vocals and beautiful sounds with rich texture. It made Rolling Stone's 500 greatest albums of all time, and for good reason. The mood it weaves throughout all of its tracks, not just the hits, make for a complete record. It was Roxy Music at their peak. A brilliant note to end on. After Avalon, the band released one more song. A cover of Neil Young's Like a Hurricane, pulled from their extensive tour. The song, while well-known and certainly a perfect fit for the sound of the Avalon era, did not chart. In 1983 Brian Ferry dissolved the band to concentrate on his solo career, as did the other members. After a few reunions, in the early 2000s the band was eventually inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2019. After Roxy Music, Brian Ferry went on to a productive solo career. Phil Manzanera also recorded several solo albums, many collaborative albums and also worked as a producer for other artists. While not as prolific as Brian Eno, he was successful in his own right. Andy Mackay recorded a few solo albums, and also worked with a number of well-known artists. That's it for our beginner's guide to Roxy Music, thanks for watching. Watch out for more beginner's guide videos to come.